Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back. This is the Tony Hernandez Show. Today is Saturday, June 28th. We're broadcasting live here at SCC Television Studios in White Bear Lake. We also broadcast on SPNN in St. Paul. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and remind you that our YouTube channel, Tony Hernandez Show, uh, we always upload our shows and, and put them out there for everybody to see. Uh, we're coming really close. Uh, I know it still seems like far away. We have a lot of summer to go, but about 130 days until Election Day. And in Minnesota, it is going to be an absolutely crucial year in terms of elections because a lot is on the line. Currently, we have one party rule in Minnesota. The Democrats have the governor, Governor Dayton, and they have the state house and the state senate majorities. So basically, all the policies that are being implemented right now, uh, the increased spending, the increased taxation, uh, these are all democratic uh, policies out there. And, you know, when you talk to people on the streets in terms of uh, the economy in Minnesota, you know, the unemployment rate, it hovers at 4.7, it might go down to 4.6, uh, kind of goes up and down. But the real measures of the economy, uh, the costs of health care, the cost of school tuition, the bring home pay, the amount of money people are making on a monthly basis is declining. And there's still a lot of major, major issues with the Minnesota economy. And really, the only party that you can hold responsible for that right now is the Democratic Party. And, you know, people oftentimes like to complain or they like to uh, basically him and haw around the water cooler, telling, telling people how bad it is. Well, this is your chance. You know, like I said, we're 130 days away from the election. And my recommendation, it doesn't matter what your uh, party is, whether you're the Green Party, your Independence Party, Republican or Democrat, is get out there, find your candidate that you can support, find the issues that you're passionate about, and hit the ground and help that person out. Because uh, beyond the, the, the whole party thing, you know, people are hurting still when it comes to the economy, and there's a lot of uncertain times. Uh, Jeff Johnson, the Republican endorsed candidate for governor, uh, points out, that uh, I believe it was a study that was done in 2012 and Minnesota uh, ranked very last. We were 51 out of the, the 50 entities. That includes Washington, D.C. Uh, we were in the very last place in terms of new business creation. And anyone who knows about the history of uh, entrepreneurialism in Minnesota, the, the great businesses that have started here, whether it's West Publishing, Dairy Queen, uh, Best Buy, Target. You could go on and on about the great companies that planted their seeds in the Minnesota Medtronic. Uh, you could just, you could, you could name them all. Uh, but slowly but surely, we're getting to a point where our economy is no longer focused on that business creation and that entrepreneurial spirit. It's more uh, geared towards uh, basically creating a system where Businesses are not encouraged to grow and create jobs here in Minnesota. They're leaving to go to more competitive states. Or if you look at uh, the case of Megtronic, uh, they're actually leaving the whole country in general. And the reason why they cited it is the tax rates. Uh, the corporate, the federal corporate tax rate in the United States is amongst the highest in the entire world. You throw on top of that the state corporate taxes and all the various payroll taxes and every tax that a business has to pay and we are becoming less and less friendly uh, to small businesses which is the uh, cornerstone for job growth so if we want if you want to see uh, incomes rise see your neighbors make more money if you want to make more money if you want to be able to save more money if you want to see the uh, equity in your real estate and your property uh, increase, then uh, we have to get on board with policies that are going to promote economic growth and job creation amongst the small business and business community here in Minnesota. So this is going to be an absolutely crucial year. And that's why we're focusing uh, this show is going to be on the great history of political debates in our great state of Minnesota. And I chose to do this topic because uh, if you look or do some research on YouTube, uh, you'll find the further and further back you go in history, uh, in terms of debates, 
uh, the more uh, viable, the more, um, the stronger those debates occur. And it seems like in the most recent history, the debates aren't there anymore. It seems like more and more of our elected officials uh, operate their campaigns in a way where they try to avoid debates completely. And for their own personal reasons, they have very good reasons to do so. Uh, it, they don't have to talk about the issues. They can uh, put out fluff commercials that, you know, talk about feel-good issues that almost everybody can pretty much agree with. Uh, but then the, the point of not having the debate is they can ignore their record and they don't have to put their record out there in the public. And people will say, oh, the Minnesotans, people don't show up to debates. People don't watch debates. And that's just a bunch of fooey. Uh, the more that you can engage the public in terms of becoming educated and knowledgeable on these issues, the more excited people can get and the more focus and attention that uh, the fellow members in the media here in Minnesota and on a national basis can direct the interests of the people towards the issues and towards the records, the faster we are going to get out of this economic slump, the faster we'll get out of this economic stagnation, and the faster that families and hardworking families here in Minnesota and across this country are going to see their incomes rise, they're going to see the property values rise, and they're going to see a renewed vitality in the local economy because ultimately uh, that is what produces the tax revenues that fund our schools, that fund our health care, that take care of our seniors, that are supposed to take care of our veterans. Uh, these revenues best come from a healthy and viable economy. And there's always the debate, should we raise taxes? Should we lower taxes? And uh, none other than President John F. Kennedy, who was a uh, progressive uh, Democrat, he was a strong advocate of lowering the tax rate because in his mind, when you lower the tax rate, what you're ultimately doing is creating uh, more economic growth. And when you have more economic growth, you have more entities, individuals, small businesses, corporations, sole proprietorships, paying taxes, which ultimately gives the government the revenues that we need to take care of our citizenry and to take care of the basic functions and roles and responsibilities of government. So as I stated, we are going to be uh, talking a lot about Minnesota historical debates here. Uh, Minnesota has a rich political history. There's a lot of very intelligent political minds. We've had great leaders from uh, all three of the major parties. And what I'm hoping as well that we're going to see as we move forward, that we're going to see uh, more and more uh, different types of candidates and also a more diverse uh, party base that's going to launch these candidates into um, uh, elected office. Because the, the model that we have right now here in Minnesota where we have uh, certain legislators who have literally been in office for decades and decades and decades, that model's not working anymore. Uh, am I an advocate of term limits? Uh, you betcha. I think it would be a great first step in terms of getting uh, a new cycle of people. You know, once you serve your certain term, um, you know, whether it's in the state house or, or, or state senate or U.S. Senate or U.S. House, that that person, you know, after what 12 years, 15 years, 16 years, whatever it is, that they should uh, have to step down from that seat and let a new person run because the power of the incumbency, it, it's just too great. The, the power that they have over their district, the way they know the district, the way they know where the money comes from their district, once they get entrenched, once they're in for uh, just a few, a few terms and once they have enough name ID, unless they kill a kitty cat on live public television, uh, the chances that that person is not going to get elected uh, is very, very small, and that's a huge problem that we have in America is the perpetual politician. Uh, we don't need that anymore, and uh, we'd all be served better if we had term limits, if we had more people, more citizens from diverse professions and working backgrounds taking part in elected government. So with that, we are going to uh, turn back the clock uh, because I mentioned about third parties, and there's a number of third party candidates uh, that are going to be rising this year. Uh, Lena Bugs, we've had her on the show. She's running for a local state house. 
Uh, we had um, Hannah Nicolet. She's uh, now running for the Minnesota governor of the Independence Party. Um, but there's more and more people who are seeking their answers outside of the D and the R a solution, which I think is a good thing, even if I may not agree with their issues 100% of the time. Uh, it's like that old saying that if you want a candidate that you can agree with 100% of the time, then what you should do is, is run for office yourself. But with that, we're going to turn back the clock to 1998. And we're going to just go over some uh, basic uh, highlights from none other than Jesse, the body Ventura. So Dallas, if we can uh, line up the screen here and we'll get it played. A great number of single parents, many of the these final candidates debate for governor of Minnesota place. took place at Twin Cities Public Television as a special broadcast of the popular series Almanac. Be careful, though, there had been earlier debates, but this one was different. Our question is to citizens from all around Minnesota asked the questions. What is your vision for economic growth and recovery here in the northwest region of the state? If the schools stay segregated with low student achievement, are you prepared to mediate the NAACP lawsuit? What incentives or tax breaks do you have for us? And be specific. If you use Jesse Ventura's plan, you would already have money. You'd have it in your pocket right now, and you wouldn't have to sit up here and listen to promises. Hi, I'm Sarah Trone, and I'm a senior at the College of St. Scholastica in Duluth. So After the debate, the citizens shared their reactions to this new type of media experience. Oh, my God. Who are you going to vote for and why? I just turned 18 and this will be my first year voting. Um, I can say I'm going to vote for Jesse Ventura. Um, to tell you the truth, I don't know why. I guess I like what he had to say. So We don't need none of the stuff that he's talking about in our community. He put it right the other night. Abraham Lincoln was a third party candidate. Uh, my opinion of Ventura is he's like a football coach who's got great pep talks but no game plan. Thanks. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's pretty amazing to see the young uh, Jesse Ventura, still not that young back then, also competing against uh, Senator Norm Coleman and also Hubert Humphrey, the third, I believe it was, for Minnesota governor in uh, 1998. And, you know, I brought that clip up because that uh, exemplifies a couple of the different things that I wanted to talk about today. And uh, the first one is a uh, name ID in politics and politicians and how that plays uh, such an important role uh, for better or for worse in winning big elections. If you think about our current governor, uh, Governor Dayton, he did not uh, get endorsed by the Democratic Party uh, prior to the primary, and he w went in there and defeated uh, Margaret Anderson Keller, and uh, he did it basically with a whole lot of money and really no campaign up to that point in the primary. Um, people joked and said that he was running uh, the campaign out of his ex-wife's um, kitchen, but you know there's a certain amount of truth to that. But the point being is that Governor Dayton benefited uh, from having the last name Dayton. Anyone in Minnesota uh, knows about Dayton's department store, they know about Marshall Fields, they know about um, you know the Dayton family, and uh, therefore it's my own personal theory, but the primary reason why uh, Governor Mark Dayton is our governor right now is uh, simply because of his last name and the massive amount of uh, personal and access to, to private money that he had in order to uh, run his campaign. And like I stated that um, he wasn't the endorsed candidate when he ran in 2010. Margaret Anderson Keller was uh, the, the DFL endorsed candidate and uh, Mark Dayton came in, uh, ran into the primary and he ended up winning. And Dallas, if we can line this up, I believe this is from the primary where uh, Margaret Anderson Keller uh, lost that as the endorsed candidate. And, and here she's telling everybody that Democrats need to unite. And so we're fast forwarding to uh, 2010. Guys, you know what? This election, this election is too important to stand on the sidelines and watch. We need to stand up. We need to stand together to defeat Tom Emmer in November. Because let me tell you about Tom Emmer. <laughs> Tom Emmer's way, Tom Emmer's way is the wrong way for Minnesota. The Emmer way means a shrinking middle class in this state. 
where Minnesotans work harder and earn less. This is not the Minnesota way, is it? No. 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 The Emmer way means that kids are packed into classrooms and their teachers are sent home with pink slips. That's not the Minnesota way, is it? No. The Emmer way means instead of health care, you get Emmer care. <laughs> and on Emmer care, you, if you lose your job or you get sick, you're on your own. That's not the Minnesota way, is it? No. no. That's Tom Emmer's way. So after seeing eight years of what Tim Pawlenty looked like, we can't afford Tom Emmer in Minnesota. Now, Unlike Representative Emmer, we in the DFL know that restaurant wage staff do not make $100,000 in tips. <laughs> And we do not consider the minimum wage to be what he referred to it as socialism. <laughs> uh, unlike Representative Emmer, we DFLers do not believe that the fund to compensate victims of the terrible I-35W bridge collapse was what he called, quote, feel-good legislation, close quote, because we know that nothing could ever make the victim of Emmer. We don't believe that he or anyone can magically make six billion dollars disappear from the state budget without drastically hurting school children and senior citizens, increasing property taxes on homeowners, farmers, and small business owners, and costing thousands more Minnesotans their jobs. Perhaps Representative Emmer actually agrees with us because he hasn't seen, seemed to have been able to produce a plan that does so either. <laughs> or else it's a secret plan. <laughs> One that he hopes he can hide from all of us until after the election. So come on, Representative Emmer, show us your plan. Show us the money. And Mr. Horner, show us your special interest clients. Now I could go on and on, and I will for the next 83 days. <laughs> Yesterday. I would like to thank all... All right, so, you know, I showed this picture, this video here, because it brings up some more important points that I was talking about in terms of name ID, name recognition, and the role that that plays in basically us having the same cycle through of candidates and uh, the same leaders over and over again. But if you look in, in the crowd or if you look in the faces behind uh, then candidate uh, Mark Dayton and also Margaret Anderson Keller, you see uh, Senator Al Franken, you see uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar, uh, you see Keith Ellison, you know, you see all these faces and these names where people right away snap and say, oh, aha, I know who that person is. And even if you study the rise of uh, Amy Klobuchar, um, you know, granted, she's a nice person. Lots of people uh, say she's warm and friendly and she uh, works for a lot of the uh, real feel-good type legislation um, that doesn't have any real... Uh, significant effects on uh, improving our economy or anything, but but it feels good. You know, she she likes to go after issues like preventing heroin overdoses in young people. Well, it's like, well, yeah, there's a, a very noble cause. It's a very, but is that really something that's even possible for a U.S. senator to to accomplish, um, or is it just her uh, promoting this idea that we all have to agree that? preventing people from overdosing from heroin is a good thing. And, you know, obviously most uh, people and most, most of you watching out there would say, yes, we do need to prevent heroin overdoses. Uh, but Amy Klobuchar's uh, father, I believe it was, was uh, Jack Klobuchar, who was a journalist with the Star P Tribune for a number of years. And the Klobuchar name uh, really uh, resonated and had a high ni name ID within Minnesota, and therefore when Amy uh, was running, everybody already knew Klobuchar, and so uh, really all she had to do was do a little bit more marketing, a little more campaigning, and she could essentially ride off those coattails. Um, I brought up Senator Franken because he's up for uh, re-election, and uh, the history of his particular seat is a contentious one, and uh, so with that, um, we're going to uh, turn the clock back uh, to 
a first speech or a first uh, debate, I should say, if I could find it here. Um, and this debate is uh, between uh, the U.S. Senators uh, Rod Grams and uh, Paul Wellstone, and this is from uh, 1996. So this is a debate between uh, U.S. Senators Rod Graham and Paul Wellstone in 1996 uh, for their election. So we'll just uh, play it uh, kind of right uh, from the beginning here, Dallas, if we can line that up. And Republican Senator Rod Graham said he will soon introduce his own bill. All of this on the heels of dueling bills introduced by two Minnesota House Democrats who usually agree with each other. Jim Overstar, of course, wants to loosen regulations on motorized vehicles and turn control over to local citizens. Bruce Vento wants to extend the wilderness. Now, it's apparent the battle over the Boundary Waters and Voyagers National Park would take no political prisoners before it's through. The newsmakers of the day, Senators Wellstone and Graham, join us from Washington. Gentlemen, welcome. Hi, Kathy. Good evening, Kathy. Senator Wellstone, first question to you. Why call in federal mediators into an issue, into a very controversial issue that really elected officials could probably take care of? Well, first of all, to avoid the wrangling, Kathy, uh, we saw what happened in 1978, and we can do a lot better. I mean, right now, where we're heading with these different bills is a polarized state, bitterness, hatred, divisiveness. I love this state, and I love the regions, and I know the people. I happen to be in a position of knowing the people on both sides. And I have said to everybody, look, we can do better in Minnesota. This alternative dispute resolution works. No one is going to be shut out. Uh, the mediation is going to take place. People are going to be assembling the parties at the end of the week. The mediators are going to, there's going to be a team of them. Calls are going to be made. And what I've said to people, Kathy, is look, far better than having a state at war with itself. 99% of the people in our state want to see some dispute resolution. Sit down with skilled mediators. It's been done around the country in other environmental disputes. We've learned a lot since 78 and work out a solution. Build the consensus and we got a much better chance of getting something positive done and avoiding a state that's just ripped apart. I don't want to see that happen as a senator now, from Minnesota. A cynic, Senator Wellstone, might say that you uh, introduced this idea of federal mediation because you're afraid to take a position on the Boundary Waters, that you're afraid of undermining your support among environmentalists and the good DFLers of the 8th District. Well, it, it is, there's one part of that that's true, which is that I have strong support in the metro area and in northern Minnesota. There are many environmentalists. I think all the people in this dispute are environmentalists. But I will tell you, I'm not too worried about my position. I am worried about Minnesota, and I think it is absolutely the responsible thing to bring people together and to work this dispute out. It can happen. People who haven't talked to each other for 18 years owe it to themselves to do it. They owe it to our state. And as senators, we owe it to our state to call on people to work this out before this just explodes. I mean, I would say to Rob, we can work together on this. I mean, Jim Overstar is supporting it. Bruce Vento was supporting it. They have very different views. People on both sides of the equation have said, look, we're skeptical. People always are before mediation, but we're going to give it our best shot. That's what should happen. And I would say to Rod, I hope that he will join in supporting well, it. Let's avoid the bitterness and the hatred. Let's try to get people sitting down through mediation well, let's and ask, come up uh, with positive change. Let's ask Senator Grams what he thinks of. pretty quiet here, haven't I, Kevin? You have been. Let's go ahead and ask you, what do you think about federal mediation for this problem? Well, I think the, when we talk about division and hatred or anger up in northern Minnesota, it's because of just tactics like this of putting another study in there, another bureaucratic step, so people don't have to make a decision on what's going on there. You know, Kathy, we held two hearings last year, and, and we got a 341-page report. We had over 2,000 people crammed into rooms. We had nine hours of hearings. We had six Minnesota delegates or delegation of six members at these hearings, nine hours. We're trying to do the job that Congress is supposed to do. And all this uh, mediation board would do, and by the way, it's a labor mediation board and not something that is really qualified to handle this type of dispute, was come up with, come up with some recommendations that we would have to come back to Congress and to work out anyway. So why throw another step in there? Basically, it's to put off the decision, not to confront the issues today, but maybe leave it for next year after another election. I think it's time that we do what we say we're supposed to do or what Congress is charged with doing, and that is to make the decisions. And we've had these problems since 1978 just because of issues like this. We're afraid to take a stand and make a decision. Well, Kathy, I'm curious. First of all, Kathy, could I please respond? Go ahead. First of all, Rod, 
needs to understand we're talking about our whole state. I never said a word. We're talking about let the me whole let state. me finish. I oh. never talked said a word about the bitterness and hatred just in northern Minnesota. I talked about a state where you had regions pitted against one another in 1978. I think we can do better. Number two, you don't understand the before you condemn an alternative dispute resolution. Understand all of the different environmental disputes that have been worked out around the country since 1978. Understand that a mediator doesn't tell people what to decide. Minnesotans sit down and they decide what we should do. And understand, Rod, what is the harm in asking? Can I ask you this? What is the harm in asking people to come together and try to work something out? Why would you be opposed to that? If Bruce Vento and Jim Oberstar can agree, and if people on both sides of the equation in northern Minnesota and metro Minnesota can agree, it's worth giving it our best shot. Okay. Why would Let's you take exception to that? Go ahead, Why would you not want to see that? First of all, I understand, Paul. Second, Why would you not want to see it? Congressman Oberstar has given just conditional support because he said, well, listen, but he also admits but that we have to go listen. back to the you legislation. Well, let, let him answer. Let him answer. Would you not support this? Go ahead. Well, you not support people coming together and trying to work this out? We did this last year. The We've had people, all the hearings. People fought. came to hearings See? and well, people had different views. Senator Mr. Wellstone Paul doesn't want to discuss this. Senator, he wants to put off the question. It's tough to go pull you guys apart with, via satellite here. Senator Why Wellstone. Why would you not want to support this? Why would you not want to support people sitting down at a Senator table? Wellstone. We've had 18 years of this type of negotiations that have failed to address the concerns that people all have never had this. Have We've had. never had alternative dispute resolution. They resolutions. have been told time and time We've never again. Senator Wellstone, I got a question no. for you. It's you tough to get this out via satellite. Senator, what it is. Senator yeah. Wellstone. Yeah. You just made a comment a couple minutes ago that it's been 18, 20 years where folks haven't talked to each other for 18 or 20 years. What makes you think they're going to talk now? I feel good about it. I have met with people in northern Minnesota. This is what I'm most proud of. And I met with people in the metro area, and I have said, for the sake of our state, sit down and talk about some of the problems and talk about common okay. ground. And you know what? I think people, you see the quotes, people are saying on both sides, Senator, we're willing to give it a try. And now my colleague is saying he condemns it before oh, people have tried. Well, now it's my fault that this won't happen. This isn't going to answer any questions. And I'll tell you, there's labor people all across the state. There's environmentalists across the state that don't like this approach okay. because they know it's a delay tax. We good. want some rational and just moderate corrections. Oh, yeah. So I found that this this was an interesting clip because, you know, here it is, 1996. I guess it's a year before an election year. You have uh, two Minnesota U.S. senators sitting in the same studio side by side, uh, definitely not agreeing on the issues. But what I find absolutely remarkable about this is that they're actually sitting side by side debating and discussing the issues at length and uh, agree or disagree with the various positions. You don't see that happening today. When's the last time that you have seen uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar and Senator Al Franken uh, sitting side by side in the same studio uh, across from a journalist or, or a reporter in a non-election year uh, discussing in great length and detail uh, the policies that they're promoting or that they're opposing. And uh, I'd venture to guess that you cannot come up with very many examples that would show this type of rigorous debate in recent times. We've, uh, I can't really put my finger on as to why the reason is that our media is not promoting more of this type of dialogue, but uh, imagine if um, our media here in Minnesota were uh, talking about the benefits and the positives and negatives to Minsher and Obamacare uh, before its implementation, before it got passed. Uh, you just didn't see that type of rigorous debate about any, any of the details, any of the, 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 the ideas or the consequences or the potential pitfalls uh, for this particular piece of legislation. We did not see any of that type of rigorous debate. And I am asserting that if our media and if uh, the people of Minnesota start demanding uh, this type of of exchange and inter interaction of ideas when it comes to public policy that we ultimately will get better policy and throw the conservative and, and liberal or progressive side out of it. Uh, in general, we will get public uh, policies that will benefit more hardworking uh, individuals, families, and small businesses in our state.
And uh, it's just something that, uh, you know, I'm trying to bring attention to everybody is that uh, we need to demand it. You know, as we enter into the 2014 election year, we need to demand that Senator Al Franken debates Mike McFadden uh, over and over and over again on all of the issues, not just a 10-minute clip here and there or not just a one-hour debate, but we want to see uh, debate and exchanges that go into great detail because Minnesota, the Minnesota public, is, is very well-educated, very well-versed. Uh, we understand uh, policies. We understand uh, the basics of a lot of the economy and economics, and we would all benefit if we were able to get uh, this type of uh, debate and this type of exchange. And modern politics has basically all but killed the debate uh, between the politicians. And as a result, I believe that we're getting worse legislation. Uh, we're getting a lot of uh, crony, uh, uh, capitalistic type pieces of legislation that go in that benefit just a very few. Uh, or there's, there's um, um, earmarks in there that have nothing to do with the broader a piece of the legislation, but there are basically handouts to, to this entity or to that person or to this special interest and whatnot. And I got a good example of uh, something that uh, a gentleman uh, who, who's not like a big time uh, reporter by no means, if I can find it here, uh, but he's just kind of your, your standard uh, run of the mill blogger. Um, but sometimes these bloggers have a lot more. Um, you know, they have a lot more interest in getting a new story out there. They have a lot more courage to confront uh, politicians, to ask them the questions that may make them feel awkward or uncomfortable, but they still have the gumption, the credibility, and the courage in order to do so. And the example that I'm going to uh, share with you all here, it's a three and a half minute clip, uh, but it's a young gentleman by the name of Jason Matera, and uh, he, uh, oftentimes the senators in, in, in the U.S. Capitol, will walk in the corridor. And that's a great time for people to, um, you know, meet the U.S. Senator and also to ask him questions. In this case, in this case uh, Jason Matera uh, asked Al Franken about a couple of minute uh, earmarks that the public didn't really know about uh, because the bill was so large, the Affordable Care Act bill so many pages, thousands of pages, uh, but he picked out some things and asked Senator Al Franken uh, what his opinions are on that. And uh, let's see when he did this. It was in 2010 on March 21st. And Dallas, if we can pop this up, uh, this is Al Franken being asked about uh, some pieces, uh, some earmarks that are in a bill. You have to shut up right now. I'm sorry. And listen to me. Go ahead. Instead of interrupting me every Sir. time I say something. Okay? I'm listening. So how is it the job of the federal government Sir, a, to no, provide the senator infrastructure is not taking questions right now? The senator for a healthy is not taking lifestyle. questions right now. Hey, Senator Franken, Jason Matera. Appreciate your remarks in there. You were awesome. Oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering, which are portions of the health care bill lower cost? Is it the provision giving $7 billion to fund jungle gyms or the provision mandating that employers provide time off for breastfeeding? Uh, I, you should know. The give me the jungle gyms. Right here. The jungle gyms yeah. is on 1184. Yeah, show it to me right now. Okay. 1184. to provide physical activity opportunities to promote healthy lifestyle. So why is that the job okay, of the federal now, government? Let, let me, why is let that me, the job of the federal no, let, government? Let, and okay, to create look, an army of monkey bars. Go it. ahead, answer if, it. If, no, no, you have to. Go ahead, answer it. You have to shut up right now. I'm sorry. And listen to me. Go ahead. Instead of interrupting me every Sir. time I say something. Okay? I'm listening. So how is it the job of the federal government Sir. A, to no, provide no. infrastructure not taking right now. The for a healthy not taking lifestyle? Questions right now. <laughs> okay, He's listen. And the breastfeeding position. Sir, excuse me. The, the breastfeeding. not taking questions. The, the no, breast I just want to answer one question, yeah. please. And if you would just stop talking for a Senator second. Senator Smalley, I'm listening. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Here's a meeting. We need to get back Sir, to the Let me finish. One second, okay? Go ahead. You came up to me yep. and said, you know the part of the bill where they give $7 billion yep. to jungle gyms? Uh-huh. 
And I said, show me that. It doesn't say that in oh, the Oh, it bill. says infrastructure for healthy living and playgrounds Senator for schools. Reed, Senator Reed, what is that, an army of monkey bars? How is that the federal government's Senator responsibility and how will that lower cost? My point But maybe you can talk about the reasonable wait, 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 wait time we, we actually for an employee to Senator express Trump. breast milk for nursing a child. I mean, how is... Are, you, are we going to have breast milk police now? Just a second. Yep. Did you notice, sir, that I asked you several times uh -huh. to let me finish and let me answer? Well, and have I'm you waiting. noticed? No. Did you notice that every time I start talking, you interrupt me? Did you notice that? Did you notice you haven't answered my question? No, I have. How have you? I said that your question wasn't accurate. It was accurate. No, you said tell me, seven billion. It dollars. is now. Tell me how providing physical activity opportunities and infrastructure. Thank you very much. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it, away from the fog of the controversy. So I think that uh, that's an interesting uh, perspective there. That brings us to the year 2010, and you know the young gentleman. Maybe he was out of line, and I, I do think he was out of line when he called uh, Senator Al Franken, Senator Smalley, and and he definitely was a little uh, uh, smart alecky with that particular comment. But I think the crux of this video shows something very important. Something that I'm trying to uh, communicate to everybody with today's show is that. Our politicians, our elected officials, they do not want to debate. They do not want to be challenged. They do not want to be asked about what's in the bills that they're supporting. They don't want to be asked about the details. They will avoid it at all particular costs. That, that young gentleman right there is actually doing stuff that our uh, current legislators and opposition should be doing and also asking the types of questions that we could only wish and hope that our media uh, here locally in Minnesota and then also across the country would be asking, you know, what's in the bill? What are the effects going to have to be? Do we need to spend $7 billion on this? What is the proper role of the federal government when it comes to employee em employer mandates such as uh, breastfeeding or uh, other aspects? We don't have that debate anymore. The debate in many, many different ways has been silenced and it's been silenced mostly because we have the same people uh, sitting in office and they're passing the baton to the same power infrastructure and they are avoiding debates completely because the more they debate, the less likely uh, they are to get elected because people will become educated and knowledgeable about the issues and then they'll be able to vote accordingly. And that's the last thing that incumbents want, or I should say the vast majority of incumbents want. And uh, as, as a uh, prelude to that, um, you know, what we're going to talk about now was um, uh, we're just going to show a, a, another clip here, okay? And this is, clip is modernizing the debate. So now we're getting into uh, Al Franken versus Norm Coleman in November 3rd, uh, 2008. So this is a 2008 elections. Uh, this is a debate. Senator Norm Coleman asked Franken to name three things that he's done for Minnesotans. And I find this interesting because it shows our progression that we're painting here. And again, we see uh, Senator Norm Coleman, his name appearing yet on another different type of race. It was the Minnesota governors before, now it's a US Senate. And uh, it really plays into this idea again that, you know, we have the same names because we have that recognition part. Oh, Coleman, Norm Coleman, or Al Franken. Yeah, I remember him from Saturday Night Live. Or uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar. Oh, yeah, her uh, father was Jack Klobuchar from, from the Star Tribune. Or uh, Dick Cohen, who's uh, been in the, the Minnesota legislature since 1978. Uh, still to this day in 2014 was in. He originally got in because his uncle was Mayor Coleman, a different Mayor Coleman than the current Mayor Chris Coleman, uh, of St. Paul. And Dick Cohen ran after that, and everybody knew the Coleman name, and he got elected basically straight out of law school. And then he will debate his opponents who have challenged him year after year after year, and every opponent that goes after him, he says that they're unexperienced, that they don't have the experience to be in 
the state senate, whereas uh, when he got his start, he was he inexperienced law student, straight into the legislature, never really had a, a real career in the private sector whatsoever, uh, straight into politics. But so we'll go into this uh, clip right here, um, and this is really showing now into the future uh, the loss of the debate, the loss of the issues. This is personality politics. This is uh, feuding, or it's just kind of the back and forth. No, you tell me this, or you're this or that. And Dallas, if we can line this up, and uh, we'll watch this. Agreed with the surge, but it was a success. But I'm, I'm not going to ask that question. My, my question, really, is, is a simple one to you, uh, and, and that and that is, uh, in your time that you've been here, can you can you tell me three things that you've done for Minnesotans to either help a farmer kind of make it through some tough, tough conditions, help a small business grow a job, or help uh, somebody in a neighborhood, you know, make that neighborhood stronger? Can you tell me? Three things that you've done since you've been back here a few years? Well, let me talk about things I've done. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk about one. Uh, I'll talk about three. <laughs> one, seven. Three would be just fine. Well, while I was here, I did work with Dr. Bob Metters on Operation Helmet. Uh, Dr. Matters. I'm not talking about the radio show. I'm talking about your radio no, show. Well, I was I'm here. You're talking about your radio show. I was something you've done. Wait a minute. I didn't. I didn't know that there were rules like that. <laughs> in your question. Directly <laughs> answer your question. I was here in Minnesota. Does that help you? Tell me about and tell me what you've done for a community that's so specific. <laughs> this well, well, now please. We all agreed we're going to be. Good people tonight, respectful people. I don't want to be a traffic cop, okay? Okay, I think your point might be that I haven't been a political office holder, so if, if you're asking what piece of legislation I've done, no, I haven't done one. Let me, uh, I've done a lot of visiting of um, chemical dependency rehabs. I wrote a, a couple movies, one when a man was a woman. I didn't write it when I was here. And, uh, wait, 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 but no, while I was here, I have visited chemical dependency centers. And I have worked with people who uh, have these programs for women, uh, specifically for women in halfway homes. And I have uh, worked with them to help people get sober. I don't, you know, I think that's important, okay? Operation Helmet was something I did while I was here, and I was doing it with, with the radio show. Uh, I've done, and then in, in the rest of the time... One more. Not, okay. Um, there's a number of things where I've done charitable events to help charities that are doing these things. I, I speak, and they raise a lot of money, and they use the money to, to, uh, to help people who are... Uh, don't have housing or, or and that kind of thing. So those those are three things. Well, Frank, and your question, please. All right, so that kind of highlights, it's entertaining, and it's deflected with a few jokes here and there. Um, yes, it's funny that Senator Al Franken really struggled to, to come up with three concrete things that he's done to benefit Minnesotans. Uh, he spent the majority of his time outside of Minnesota, in New York and California and other places. And so, yes, he hasn't spent that much time there. So how does Franken get elected? Well, it's easy, name recognition. And uh, it's something that is taking away from the debate that we all deserve as voters. Instead of uh, Senator Coleman asking Al Franken about uh, what he's done, he, they should be talking about the issues. They should be talking about the policies. They should be talking about the, the, the things that are most vital and the things that people care about the most and affect the daily lives of the people of Minnesota. And this is an example where that's just completely obliterated. And if you watch presidential debates or if you watch other big-time debates, uh, you'll see a lot of the same stuff. It's very entertaining. Uh, there, you, you'll always hear the one-liners that'll get people laughing or to make people say, ooh, and, or ah, and, 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 and make their point in this like bullet point, uh, talking point manner. But there's no depth to it. There's no real debate. 
and this is robbing from uh, what we all deserve and, and like I stated before we, we need to know better the policies that are being passed and the laws that are being passed and what's that doing to our future because uh, the economy again is stagnant right now people are making um, basically the same amount of money that they were making five years ago and there's not a whole lot of change or promise or hope around the corner and we absolutely need the debate we need a vigorous debate to talk about how we can change these particular things. Politicians do not like to debate. It's a fact, if you're an incumbent, you don't wanna debate because you're giving your opponent opportunities to pick apart your record, to, keep, to build name identification, and to also talk about what they would do and to draw a contrast. Without the debate, the non-incumbent, the challenger, is at a severe disadvantage because the only other way that they'll be able to compete is with message and money, and that means uh, lots and lots of money so that they can get the TV ad space time, the radio time to build their name ID, to be able to compete with a name like Klobuchar or Dayton or Franken or uh, Oberstar. And uh, that brings us to uh, the next uh, clip that I wanted to, to bring in, and this is from uh, 2010 which was a miraculous year in uh, the 8th Congressional District of Minnesota. This was a year when 35-year incumbent Jim Obistar uh, basically was uh, fired from his position, resigned, or not resigned, I'm sorry, he was retired by Chip Kravak, who only served one term, but he produced a miracle in the 8th Congressional District. Chip Kravak defeated the 35-year incumbent Jim Oberstar. And uh, somebody posted this video on YouTube, and it's uh, the top 10 Oberstar moments from the October 19th debate, 2010. And this is right around the time where the polls were showing that the race between Chip Kravak and Jim Oberstar was a dead heat. So there was tons of people excited about this on both sides, passionate. Uh, they were ignited, and over 1,800 people went to this uh, infamous debate, and really a lot of people credit this moment as when they uh, knew that Chip Kravak had solidified his victory, and you can see the uh, disgust, the contempt, and uh, much other feelings uh, from Jim Oberstar that are directed at a portion of his constituency, and you see a lot of those same uh, feelings of that Al Franken showed when he was confronted by the blogger that why are you asking me this? You don't understand. You're a flat earther. You know, just shut up. You need to listen to me. That type of uh, contempt for being challenged uh, for the positions they hold in the people's seat. So uh, with that, we're going to watch the top 10 Oberstar moments from the October 19th, 2010 debate, a historical year, uh, no doubt about that. Put him in limbo, so they're not hiring. 
and this could have been a bipartisan agreement and the Congressman Oak Star voted to adjourn. Of course, this that's will simply not true. That's pretty much uh, the, the final nail in the coffin, I think, is when he called a, a big portion of the people who were viewing that debate uh, members of the Flat Earth Society. Um, it didn't go down well with a whole lot of people, and a lot of people used that as the, the, the moment they saw the sink or the ship sink. And, uh, you know, finally, we're, we're running out of time here, but I wanted to, to go over a, a one last very, very important issue here. Now, Dallas, if you can pop up here on the screen, uh, this is breaking news. Um, there's a big uh, primary challenge in Phyllis Khan's district, Representative Phyllis Khan, and she's being challenged by Mahmoud Noor, and uh, they had a challenge for the endorsement. If you remember, that endorsement was contentious. Uh, there was a, a DFLer, a Somali American, who was assaulted at the actual caucus. Uh, there's been allegations of a whole lot of dirty play. And uh, Phyllis Khan, who has been in the state uh, House of Representatives for quite some time, she's facing a primary challenge against Mohammed Noor, who is a Somali American uh, from that same district, which is a, a heavily Somali district. So anyways, I'm going to read this to you. Absentee voting started Friday, six weeks ahead of primary elections. Already there are strong allegations of voter fraud. The attorney for Representative Phyllis Kahn says he got word Thursday night there may be hundreds of people who are registering and voting using an address that's not their home. And I just want to accentuate that these are Democrats making allegations against other Democrats for voter fraud. Absentee voting kicked off Friday morning in a hotly contested Democratic primary race for the State House between incumbent Representative Phyllis Khan and Mohammed Noor. Uh, Brian Rice, attorney for the Phyllis Khan Veterans uh, Volunteer Committee, claims there is voter fraud. And Representative Khan, I believe, has gone on the record stating that there is no vo voter fraud. And, and here we are, 2014, after the voter ID debate of 2012, where Democrats are out there saying that there is voter fraud and there's voter fraud for this com upcoming primary. It's just absolutely astonishing stuff here. Uh, they, they allege, I think there is a coordinated effort to use this address to bring voters into the DFL primary election on August 12th. That's what I think is going on, said Rice. It's wrong. It violates Minnesota law. It's a crime. According to voter registration records from the Secretary of State's office and the DFL Voter Activation Network, more than 140 people use 419 Cedar Avenue South in Minneapolis as their home address where they, when they registered to vote. The address is what's called Cedar Mailbox Center. The building manager mail center's employees weren't comfortable speaking on camera, but they said they were surprised by the allegations. They say nobody put the wrong address on purpose. For 13 years, for 13 years, many Somali Americans from across the state have been getting their mail there, and who knows how long they've been voting from there, whether they live there or not. Uh, so this has been going on for over a decade, and just now, uh, the Democrats and represent Phyllis Khan of all people are alleging that this address is being used for fraudulent uh, purposes in terms of voting, which is a felony. Uh, they're asking for an investigation, and it says under state law you must live in the precinct where you're voting, and it says it's possible that some of these new v registrants have already voted and that they don't live there. 
Um, so this is just uh, absolutely astounding stuff here. And, um, you know, I wanted to bring this attention because, you know, in 2012, again, we had the voter ID debate to change the Constitution to require a photo ID for uh, voters of Minnesota to have to produce in order to vote to get rid of the anonymous vouching system uh, where, you know, basically one person can vouch for up to 13 individuals and say, yep, they all live in my precinct. They don't need IDs. They don't need to register. And they can register and vote that same day. Uh, I, I'm sorry, they don't need to pre-register, but with the vouching, they can register and vote that same day. Democrats have been uh, combating the Republicans, saying there is no voter fraud. And it's just simply amazing that all of a sudden when you have uh, a Democrat incumbent versus another Democrat fighting against each other, all of a sudden you have uh, one Democrat who said there was no voter fraud, alleging that there's voter fraud, picking out the address, giving the facts, uh, stating how many people uh, potentially have registered there illegally and knowing all of this. And the, the real question is, and I wonder if anyone will do any investigation about this, is how long have they known about this 419 Cedar Avenue? How long have they known that there could be voter fraud taking place from this address? And how long have people remained mum about it because they know darn well who those people are going to vote for or what party they're going to vote for. So these are things that we need to keep our eye on. We need people investigating into. And with that, I'm going to play this clip uh, from Betty, uh, Representative Betty McCollum. Uh, this is from a debate with Teresa Collette. This is from 2010. And Betty McCollum is asked about voter fraud, and she toes the, the party line uh, by stating this. By, by that, um, it's like when I, when I go to the polls, I don't have to take out my driver's license. I don't have to take out my uh, a form of ID to say who I am. When I go to my local precinct, uh, people know uh, who I am. Uh, they, they know uh, that uh, there isn't a, a rampant problem with voter fraud in this country. <laughs> there just isn't. <laughs> The Fox 9 investigators discovered 93 convicted felons in prison or on supervised release who have registered to vote. In 2008, over 23,000 Election Day registrants provided unverifiable addresses. There were 17,000 more ballots than documented voters. Dozens of voters are being investigated for double voting. There's even evidence of deceased people and non-citizens on our voter rolls. the left-wing activist group ACORN is now under investigation in at least 13 states for widespread voter registration fraud. I found credible evidence that... So that uh, just highlights some of the, the story there, but you know, the long-standing Democratic position is that there is no voter fraud and it's just a figment of center-right conservatives and independents and Republicans uh, minds that there is voter fraud and you know again just where this story came from was representative Phyllis Kahn now in a heated contested primary uh, for her state house seat uh, that she's been holding for decades literally I think she was elected in the 1970s uh, is now alleging that there is voter fraud and that it's being perpetrated by um, a certain address where there's hundreds and hundreds of people registering to vote from this one address and she's alleging that they don't actually live where they live and this should just bring it to everybody's attention that it doesn't matter if voter fraud is benefiting one for this party or for that party people with integrity want integrity in the voting system it's not about the results of the election who you want to win it's about do th doing things the right way counting votes the right way and making every vote count. So uh, we're coming to the end of the, our time here, but I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Thank SCC Television Studios and SPNN. We broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on our YouTube channel, Tony Hernandez Show. May God bless you. May God bless America. And bye con Dios.